Thank you for joining today. Hey, before we get started, um, I'll introduce myself and go through the talk, but just out of curiosity, if everyone could raise their hands and tell me, have you heard of a data mesh? Okay, great, a lot of you. A lot of you probably attended Zamak Degani's keynote this morning. Um, how many of you would you feel comfortable explaining what a data mesh is to somebody else at this point? Raise, raise your hands. Okay, good. Okay, we'll cover a little bit of that in my talk today as well. Um, so that being said, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself and, and the talk we're doing. So we're gonna talk about breaking barriers in real time with data streaming, change data capture, and streaming SQL. So just a bit about myself. Uh, I've been in the software and data industry for almost 10 years. Uh, I studied computer science with a background in uh, distributed systems, data visualization. Those have always been my areas of passion. I don't know if any of you worked with uh, Hadoop or distributed file systems or D3.js or any of that fun stuff, but that's where I got my uh, original programming chops. Um, I work at a company called Stream, and I also run a podcast called What's New in Data that's available on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, where we bring on a lot of data practitioners to talk about latest trends. So before I get into my talk, I want to cover some the macro of business intelligence pipelines. Uh, so traditionally, pipelines used to run in on-premise systems. Maybe some of your pipelines still do run in on-premise, but essentially, a lot of them were bottlenecked by hard resources, such as what you have in your data center, uh, the servers that you've already procured, uh, physical space that you have in your data center. And you know, a lot of the feedback that the market was giving was, hey, you know, this is good, but you know, on Monday mornings, as you know, people are running lots of reports and workloads, the on-premise data center would choke. You'd have to scale it out basically to meet your peak throughput at all times, which became cost prohibitive and hard to scale up and down as usage needed. So what we've seen this evolve into is cloud analytics platforms. Some call it the modern data stack, where you're essentially able to build your business intelligence and data infrastructure using scalable cloud systems, uh, whether they run AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, where you can essentially use things as you need them. You can scale out your compute as more reports are coming in. You can scale down your usage when there's more of a, a downtime or less workloads going on. And this has become very popular and we've seen so many companies shifting to cloud-based architectures in the last couple of years. Now, this hasn't come without any problems. People are now talking about what's called the data swamp or how it's being phrased by a few, few companies and data practitioners such as Chad Sanderson, where essentially companies are sending a lot of data to the cloud, but the business value, the modeling, you know, the, the, the latency of the target systems, those things haven't been figured out up front, and therefore there's waste, there's unused data, there's uh, superfluous compute, superfluous spend, and you know, this is a side effect of the ELT dilemma. ELT is a data integration pattern called extract, load, transform, where you're essentially loading your data to the cloud or your warehouse and figuring out how you want to model and transform it later. It does you know, help you bootstrap your uh, cloud analytics systems faster, but at the same time, it does create some waste in terms of knowing how you want to model your data and what type of workloads you want to run. So, you know, these are the types of things that teams need to think about up front. You know, what is the data model that I'm serving to my business users, whether it's in reporting use cases or reverse ETL or oper operationalized analytics? What's the latency tolerance of my target systems, right? So data warehouses will have ingest throughput issues compared to streaming and messaging systems uh, cloud databases will also have some uh, bottlenecks in terms of how fast they can ingest data in the cloud. Um, and these are all technical challenges, right? So really what we want to encourage everyone to do in the data industry is shift your thinking to data products. It's data as a product intentionally designed for business use cases, data as a product with the goals of your end users in mind. 
So your actual end users and business stakeholders, the people who are running the reports, people consuming the reports, work backwards from their use cases and build your data infrastructure to meet their, their actual requirements. So let's take a logical view of building data products. And this ties into some of the discussions around data mesh, data fabric. I'll get into some of those definitions in a second, but essentially the logical view is, hey, being able to take data off your business and operational applications, loading them through a streaming system, and then finally, when they go into a cloud data warehouse, a cloud database, a message bus like Kafka or AWS Kinesis, now you're feeding this data into business domains. So this, this ties into the principles of data mesh where you are thinking about your data in, in the context of the domains that are consuming it. So a few patterns here with, with data streaming and data integration where you're able to take data off your data sources, which are op operational applications, your mission critical database, your CRM like Salesforce, uh, your ERP systems, and you just stream that data to the cloud. And when I say stream into the cloud, it could be something as sophisticated as a, you know, a model in a data warehouse. It could be something as simple as just putting it into uh, S3 or some type of object storage. And then once that data is there, you can build applications later once the data is already in the cloud. But when you are streaming it, you are reducing the latency. Here's a second pattern, which is streaming analytics, where as data is captured from the operational systems, you're able to actually model it, transform it into the analytical view in real time, in an incremental fashion, as data is coming in, and you're able to deliver that data to the analytics consumers in real time in the analytics ready format. Now taking this one step further, uh, the third streaming pattern, which is actionable intelligence, some of you may have heard of this as reverse ETL, where you're loading data into the analytical systems, using those models to essentially trigger workflows back to the CRM, back to the ERP system. An example of which would be, hey, let's take raw data from our operational systems, our website activity, and let's generate a smart MQL score, a smart marketing lead score, load that data back into Salesforce as a lead. And we've seen this confirmed by, you know, the interesting news this week, which was Snowflake and Salesforce partnering on bi-directional data movement. So lots of momentum, lots of interest in this specific data pattern in the industry. So one of the advantages of streaming pipelines, uh, especially in the context of stream, I'll get into what stream is. Uh, is being able to deploy it as a fully managed service, uh, being able to self-deploy it in the cloud, or run it on-premises. This is the architectural, logical view of generation three, which is real-time data products. So real-time data products is the idea of taking this data, whether it's you know in a database, in a CRM, or any of these systems on the left, transforming and modeling the data in flight, ready for analytics use cases, not copying data, right? So using data efficiently, using streaming SQL pipelines, combined with change data capture to capture the data in real time. Uh, finally, loading the data into a cloud system, whether it's a warehouse, object storage, a database, SQL or no SQL, and then feeding that back into systems of consumption, such as your reports, right? Uh, whether you're using Power BI, Tableau, ThoughtSpot, this could be as simple as your, your weekly reports, reducing the latency and data freshness of getting the data in the reports. So your business stakeholders always have trust that the data is in real time or near real time, or feeding this operational analytical data back into systems like CRMs, Dynamics, Salesforce, uh, a Slack channel where people can actually action the data. So I'm gonna walk through this in the context of a, a Fortune 500 retail company that wanted to build a decentralized data analytics infrastructure 
where they have one source of data, but they have many consumers of the data with different use cases. And in this case, it's retail, but it can, this is horizontal and that it can be applied to any industry where essentially I'm taking operational data and I'm feeding it to n number of consumers who all have different use cases for it. So, and when I say use cases, I mean the actual data model, the format of the data, the freshness of the data, the way that it's materialized in the target systems, and we'll get into that. Another part of the requirement that's very interesting is the concept of data contracts. So the problem is schemas and objects and operational systems can change at any time, right? The engineering teams or the ops teams that run them don't wanna have to go to the analytics team and tell them every time that the, the schemas are changing. Teams need to be more nimble than that. However, what you can do is implement data contracts, which can at least alert when you have a schema that violates your analytics pipelines, tell your consumers to either change the analytics pipelines to adhere to the new schema, or if the schema adheres to the contract, you're able to propagate that schema change automatically to your analytics systems. An example being, you know, you're doing change data capture off of a Postgres database, or it could be an Oracle database. Someone changes a schema there by altering a column or adding a table. If it adheres to your data contract, you can just apply that same DDL statement to your target data warehouse. Now, if the schema change will break your analytics, then you wanna alert your teams either in Slack or some sort of other operational system where you can tell your data engineers, hey, this schema change, the analytics pipelines can't handle this type of schema change. Stop your pipelines, fix it, bring it back online. So that's another interesting concept that many others are, are starting to implement. So prerequisites, so you can build out this use case in Stream Cloud. Stream Cloud is now available in European regions, both UK and uh, West Europe and North Europe. Um, and it also runs natively on top of Kafka, which we fully manage. Um, a similar parallel stack you could do this with is uh, the DBZM Kafka KSQL stack. But in this case, we're running it through what our customer did, which is our fully managed service running on stream. So this is the, the, the logical view of building decentralized data pipelines that take one source of data and feed it to multiple consumers who have different requirements for the data. And you can see that the requirements span across different types of cloud databases that we're writing to, different types of cloud data warehouses, different data freshness SLAs, right? What is a data freshness SLA? You're able to tell your consumer that the data that you're seeing in this report is within 15 minutes of freshness or 30 minutes of freshness. You're able to give that confidence to your end users. And in some cases, it can be as fast as one second. And I'll see how, and I'll, and I'll show everyone how we built that specifically, but it's with decentralized, decoupled streaming pipelines. So I'll go through each app um, one by one. So starting with uh, the production database reader. So in this case, we're using Stream's Oracle reader. We, we also have the option to use Stream's OJet reader, which is the world's fastest change data capture engine for Oracle. Uh, we have benchmarks that we can share later. But essentially we're doing log-based change data capture off of a production Oracle database. We only have one reader on the database to minimize overhead on that on that database because you don't want to bring on more clients that are polling an operational database because you're causing a lot of issues in terms of additional compute on the database. You're, you're adding more disk IO, things that you want to minimize by doing change data capture with a single reader. Now, we're going to go through all the consumers of the data. In this case, the first one is a real-time Snowflake writer. So being able to balance cost and performance by taking the, the specific tables that you want to stream to Snowflake in real time, not all the tables, but just those specific tables with a real-time SLA, being able to model the data into a low inventory format for this retailer where they can identify, okay, this, these are the traits of, a, of an item that's running low in stock. 
we want to create that table in real time and stream with the stream streaming SQL layer, stream that data directly into a table in Snowflake. And that table in Snowflake will have some model run on top of it that refreshes uh, on, on faster uh, frequencies. So that was the first app. The rest of the apps are taking the other tables, which have near real-time SLAs. I'm going to call it that because in the data warehousing world, 15 to 30 minutes is, is, is pretty close to being real-time. And in this case, you're able to optimize for cost rather than performance. So if I know that these other views can be ingested every 30 minutes, then I'm just going to take those tables, identify them, and then have them load to Snowflake every 15 or 30 minutes or five minutes, whatever the, the data freshness SLA is. So now you're able to say, hey, for these real-time tables, we'll model it in real-time, do the compute in the streaming layer, stream it directly into Snowflake in that format in real-time. For my other tables, I'm just going to load them every five minutes, every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, optimized for cost rather than performance. The other consumer of the data is an operational team that's building a consumer-facing application in the cloud, right? Because the inventory database that's running on-prem or, or closer to that warehouse isn't the same database that they're going to use to build the consumer-facing e-commerce application that's going to feed to your iPhone or your Android. So this group actually needs the data in close to real time, and they do not want to propagate schema changes because their application logic is so heavily tied to the schema of the data in their database. So they're going to say, okay, if there's a schema change in the upstream inventory database, we actually want you to halt and alert on that so we can resolve the schema change on our end. Whereas in the Snowflake use cases, if we're adding tables or altering columns, we're more, uh, we're able to uh, deal with those schema changes more efficiently. Now this fifth application is a really interesting one, which is being able to A-B test query logic, right? So I want to try out a bunch of different streaming SQL queries, see what the result set is, right? Because I can make little changes to the aggregation, to the time window, things along those lines, write it to an event table in stream, uh, which, is, uh, which is our product, compare the results, see which one best adheres to the model that you want to serve to your, to your end users, which one makes more sense and which one's more usable. We were able to do that type of QA and A-B testing in the streaming layer so that you don't have to have superfluous storage and compute jobs running in your warehouse or, or your cloud database. So kind of having that, that testing ground to say, if I run these types of queries, what is my model going to look like? What is my what is actual aggregated data going to look like? And you're able to use this with our uh, version of streaming SQL, which I've labeled as a CQ, which is short for continuous query. So a continuous query is essentially streaming SQL that will run automatically in memory as new events arrive. And stream as a streaming engine is optimized for these incremental event-based workloads, whereas the Snowflakes, Azure Synapse, BigQuery, you know, Cloud Data Warehouse are more optimized for your batch workloads, historical queries, things along those lines. Now, this is another pattern that's critical, especially when you think about data mesh, which is, speed, which is feeding data to multiple business domains without essentially affecting non-concerned domains with workloads that aren't related to them. So in stream, what we do is persist the data within our engine so that you can essentially replay data between independent, isolated consumers at different points. So let's say that I have a Oracle CDC stream coming in, right? We're going to persist those logs on our end so you don't have to rely on replaying the data from your Oracle logs because those logs could roll over at any time. You don't necessarily have control over that. Now, I have my Oracle CDC stream persisted in the stream layer. I'm feeding it to Snowflake, and I'm feeding it to a database writer. The database could be AWS, RDS, Aurora, Google Cloud Span, or whatever it is. Now, the warehouse and the database may have different latency in terms of ingesting the data. So essentially in stream, we're able to checkpoint 
where the Snowflake writer left off versus where the database writer is reading from. So if one of them goes offline, it's not going to impact the other consumers, right? If one consumer goes down, the other consumers are still reading data. They're still keeping up with the operational workloads. And when that offline data system comes back online, it's able to resume where we left off using streams underlying checkpointing mechanisms. But this is essentially when you're building out a data mesh and you're trying to feed multiple data consumers, you want to think about decoupling uh, the workloads based on the data system and the isolated compute that you need to run to ingest that data. So other common operations are essentially monitoring lag between source and target, between producer and consumer. So I can see between my Oracle database and my Snowflake writer to these specific tables, what is my lag? How far is my Snowflake model behind my operational Oracle database? Or you know, be able to say for these specific tables in my database writer or my Kafka queue, what's the lag there? So even on an independent, isolated basis, being able to monitor lag across these systems. So for each consumer, you're able to tell them very quickly, hey, are we meeting your data freshness SLA or not? And you're able to catch uh, those types of issues faster. Also being able to add more tables on the fly with what we call CDDL, which stands for common DDLs, such as adding tables, simple alter columns. If it's simple enough, we should be able to automatically propagate that to consumers that can handle it, right? And this comes back to the concept of uh, data contracts. The third one, which is resyncing due to an, uh, a crash or an outage, this also comes back to uh, stream essentially being, being able to isolate the resources that are doing read and write on different compute, being able to handle exceptions independently. So one consumer going down doesn't bring down the others. And then when I am reconciling from a failed or a crash state due to systems going offline, that operation is also uh, completely isolated from the consumers that have been online the whole time. So in summary, I know that was a lot, but to avoid a data swamp, Start thinking about your data like a product. Think about the end users and the business use cases first, and then model your infrastructure based on that. As much as possible, decouple your sources, meaning your operational source systems, your transforms, the target systems that you're writing to with streams, and isolate resources with microservices and dedicated compute. This will also help you deliver the principles that Zamak Degani was talking about this morning in her data mesh keynote, which does allow you to essentially adhere and serve all your business stakeholders independently with your own de decentralized data infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. Uh, I hope it was useful for you. I, I, I write about data all the time on my LinkedIn and on my Twitter, so follow me there. Also, follow our podcast. We have lots of... Uh, data practitioners, uh, Seattle data guy, uh, Bruno Aziza from Google, uh, lots of great guests in the past, and we're going to continue having great guests in the future. If you want to be a guest, come talk to me. Um, I'm always happy to talk to data practitioners about the latest, greatest things that they built, cool things that are actually working for them in the real world. And that's what the podcast is all about. It's called What's New in Data. Uh, we have these coasters at your seats uh, with the QR code uh, for the podcast and more resources where you can learn more. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the show.